popular perception of a moa is a long dead, large, flightless, ostrich sized bird from New Zealand. In truth, there were nine species, and they ranged in size from an oversized turkey up to the three metre high ones that get all the attention. This, for example, is an appropriately named stout legged moa and was about half a metre high and weighed about 50 kilograms. The extinction of the species coincided with man's arrival into New Zealand and the first ones to disappear were ironically the large ones. Prior to human's arrival, moas were abundant across both islands. Best calculations, about 60,000. It wasn't just hunting that knocked them off, either. The widespread practice by Maori to clear forests by burning reduced their habitat as well. What also counted against moa were their brooding habits. They took an unusually long time to reach maturity and only laid two eggs per year max if at all. The eggs were incubated by the male. Examples of complete moa eggs are extremely rare. Any moa that did get to maturity would live to about 50 years. New Zealand birds are amongst the longest living. The New Zealand kakapo holds a longevity record for any bird at 90 years. The moa's extinction process was comparatively quick. Carbon dating indicates 200 years or thereabouts. The science says the last moa walked or scuttled around New Zealand in about 1500. Despite the overwhelming evidence indicating their non-existence, periodic sightings have occurred for a good 150 years, particularly in the 1800s. Reports back then came thick and fast. And then there was a notable drop-off until in January of that year the world's media was focused on the Arthur's Pass National Park in the South Island of New Zealand. There had been a sighting of a single beast and with it a hideously out of focus photo. The press and public were immediately divided as to the authenticity of the story. A good example of this was the British Ladbrokes Betting Agency. They put the odds of the sighting being real on the same par as the Loch Ness Monster. That's to say, 1000 to 1. And the blowtorch was placed upon the three trampers who had made the sighting. The three were Sam Wobby, a Christchurch school teacher, Patty Freeney, a publican, and his partner, Rochelle Rafferty, who listed her profession as the gardener at Patty's Hotel. These were not day hikers. They were vastly experienced mountaineers with decades of experience in the New Zealand bush. The main focus went on Freeney, who perchance was about to take over the local pub in Arthur's Pass. The accusations of it being a massive publicity hoax started immediately, and exist through to this day. The Irish-born Freeney was a no-nonsense sort of chap. Not only had he been in the SAS, he went on to become one of their main outdoor instructors. As the trio's spokesman, Freeney was deadpan about the sighting. 
even fronted up to a meeting of the local Skeptic Society to answer their questions. Shortly after this report, historic sightings were also announced around Moana, which is about 50 kilometres as the Haast Eagle flies from the Beely pub. Helicopter companies were soon taking journalists up and down valleys in the National Park in the hope that they too could score their own prized photo. The local rumour mill went into overdrive. One of those rumours was Freeney and some of his mates were spotted at the Canterbury Museum the week prior, taking a close interest in their stuffed specimen. Apart from the anecdotal reports of the three trampers, the only other piece of evidence was that blurry photo. It was poured over by experts, and the reports were varied. Subsequent testing of the negatives have also been inconclusive. What are my feelings? They remain the same as I was in Arthur's Pass exactly at that time. Number one. To be viable, any species requires about a minimum of 50. Go below that and it's a slippery slope to extinction. There couldn't have been just one. Logically, it had to have parents to start off with. One means 50 or more. I've already highlighted they were comparatively slow breeders, and clearly Maori didn't have any trouble locating them. But somehow nowadays they've become awfully elusive evading even hunters with high-powered scopes. The young also have a canny ability of remaining undetected, and when they die, they do so in locations, which means their remains will never be found by a human. Number two. To repeat, most mowers weren't the ones you see plastered all over the place. That's a picture of the skeletal remains of a mower. The entirety of which fits inside that box. Now if you're going to put your money on any of the nine species surviving till today, and a million to one seems fairer odds to me, then it would have to be one of the forest floor dwellers, and not the six footer as was claimed. Number three. I know Arthur's Pass well. I can get from my house to the Beely pub in about 90 minutes. I also do off-road trail running. From the time it would take me to get out of my car at this location and up to where it was spotted would be another five hours. Incidentally, the Beely Hotel and sponsors and acts as the finishing line for an annual run over Avalanche Peak, which is only 600 metres off the largest in the park. And this is what the top of that location looks like. You can also walk up there from the Arthur's Pass village with a modicum of fitness. Does this look more country to you? Arthur's Pass simply isn't that remote. I've never been to a hut there and found it empty. In size, the park is 1,200 square kilometres, which makes it about 10% of Fiordland National Park. And that expanse in Southland isn't 90 minutes away from New Zealand's second largest city. That's why the stories of the Fiordland moose still roaming the wilds after their release in 1910 are within the realms of possibility. And incidentally, tramping in Arthur's Pass is a doddle, 
compared to that in Fair Woodland. And whilst I'm talking about Fair Woodland, I've got a video on New Zealand's most remotest place. So if you want to find out where New Zealand's remotest place is, take a look at that. Both Wobby and Freeney died in 2012. Freeney stuck to his story until his death. A year later, Paddy was on top of Mount Everest. No, you don't need to clear your ears out. You heard that right. Rochelle, his wife, took his ashes up the world's highest peak on her ascent. That was where they were scattered. The Moa statues outside the pub are an ever-present reminder of this cool tale. And being a cool person yourself, I know you're going to take 10 seconds to press that subscribe button. Thanks for your time today and I'll spot you next time.